Yes, yes, team, and welcome to another episode of the Total Mental Performance Podcast. Our guest today is James Sutton. Uh, I've actually seen him speak uh, at the Supercharged event uh, with Ollie Carson, and uh, those guys, what they know about exercise mechanics, uh, body mechanics, and all of that, I'm a newbie. I don't know enough about that stuff, but watching them lead a group of quite experienced PTs in there was uh, really, really good to see. Uh, James is the co-founder of the PT Project, and he works mainly in direct coaching as well as education. Uh, James, welcome to the Total Mental Performance Podcast. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So how did you get to where you've got to? Because you've been in the industry a while and you've done a lot here. So where did it all yeah. start for you? Yeah. How long have we got? Where far, how far back do we want to go? <laughs> so I think like some people, when you ask, oh, why did you get into the industry? And then start going on the value side of stuff. Oh, it's my meaning. It's the call to action side of thing. I was like, I was in the early 20s. I read a little bit about personal development, stuff like that. But at that point in time, I tried to pursue a professional basketball career. Didn't really go as well as I hoped. If anyone knows about basketball in this country, you ain't getting paid for it, rarely. Wow. <laughs> so, um, and I was like, I need a different route previously to trying to pursue professional basketball and had a graphic design place at Leeds University I was like no I just don't want to go into that and it literally came down to the fact of I love training I love being around people I feel I can build rapport connection on a one-to-one -one basis uh, with people let's see where I can take this and outside of playing basketball or doing stuff socially with mates and stuff like that when I was late teens stroke early 20s I was always reading up I always had the latest Muscle and Fitness magazine or Flex uh, back then. And that was always the go-to every month. I was buying the magazine and reading it and going through. So it was a huge passion in a sense there. And I was like, well, let me just take it and see where it goes. And at that point in time, I probably never really saw it as a, a long-term career in a sense. Um, like so many people, when you get into it, it's, I don't want to say frowned upon because it's maybe slightly different nowadays, but I'm talking 17 years ago when I got into the industry um, side stuff. So it wasn't seen as a like a long term career in terms of, OK, when you get to 40, which I'm about to be very soon, um, 40, 45, 50, what are you going to do then? Are you mm -hmm. still going to be working in the gym? Because there wasn't online coaching in a sense as it is uh, nowadays back then. Um, so, yeah, it's really down. There's no deep, meaningful reason behind it. It's like I enjoy training. I'm always reading about it. I love helping people. I love being around people. Let me get a job in a gym and see where it takes me. I love that. Okay. And you know, Naval Ravikant, one of the most successful entrepreneurs and, and investors on the planet, really, really interesting guy. Um, he says something which is, it's important that you don't assemble your path too deliberately. It's important yeah. that you don't go into things because of the money. And I'm seeing a lot of long, young coaches coming into the industry, seeing, you know, all, all the coaches in, in Dubai and Bali and traveling the world. And they're, they're coming in, they're like, right, I'm coming in here to get paid. Yeah. But when you try and organize things not too deliberately and you kind of just follow your nose, I think that's when you meet people with longevity. When you get meet, watch people that kind of follow their nose and they're like, this is interesting. I find this, I'm passionate about this. I find that, that's really cool. How does this work? How does this operate? When you follow your nose and you follow your intuition and what you're actually interested in, and then you find a way to get paid for that and you focus on delivering results, that, they're really the coaches that I see with longevity. You've probably seen plenty of coaches over the years that come in 12 months, smash yeah. out of the park, and then they're gone because they couldn't handle yeah. it. And they came yeah. in for and the... Something you touched on there, which I'm such a believer on, is that you can't be so deliberate about your path. I know it's taught or sometimes in the personal development space or the mentoring place. Okay, so what's your five-year goal? What's your 10-year yeah. goal? Put it out, put it on a vision board and map it and then reverse engineer it. When I look back over a five-year period, if I look prior to that, I never envisioned where I was going to be. Sometimes within a year, things will happen. We'll go in a completely different direction, let alone bloody five years. There's certain big jumps that I've made within my career that I never would have been able to envision. One of them I speak to is probably the most recent one in a sense as being part of the muscle mentors. I never started within the muscle mentors thinking our oh, three years later, I'm not going to be part of that. It was the vision that started and obviously working alongside Callum and Luke as part of the muscle mentors there, that that was going to be the journey for the next five, 10 years. And it took a completely different route on there. So we've got to have sort of short term focus and sometimes an idea of where we want to be long term. 
but we can never nail that down to a precise thing because it's going to change so much um, because we don't know literally what's going to happen week to week, day to day, who we're going to meet. I never knew that I was going to chat to you on the Ollie, Ollie Carson's event, which then leads to a podcast. You don't know when that's going to lead to other things, other opportunities, who knows um, on there. So yeah, I so agree with the fact that we don't want to be so definite about where we're going to be years from now because that can so easily change. Yeah, and the world's changing much faster than ever. You know, if we look at COVID, that essentially accelerated the online world and for people to do things online a lot more. If we look at, you know, even just markets and individuals. My view is if you have a, and, and again, this is different being a coach and being an entrepreneur versus being, say, somebody that's in a law firm or a CEO of a FTSE 100 company. They need five to 10 year plans. It's a different yeah, ballgame. Yes. But if, yeah. you're, if you're a coach, or if you're you're an entrepreneur or you're a small business owner, you know, maybe you've got a team of, of zero to 25 or 50 people, you know, um, you're going to evolve so much and you're going to change so much. Like if you can predict where you'll be in, in 10 years time, number one, my view is you, you're probably not ambitious enough. Like right? you're probably not <laughs> ambitious enough or two, you're not um, adaptable. You're not ready for change. And you, you, there is an element of surrendering to your path and going, okay, well, I thought this was the path. And actually I saw, I come to a crossroads. I'm not even a crossroads, like a Y neck. And I realized instead of going right, I'm not going to go a completely different course. I'm going to go left, but the long-term trajectory of going left and right then, then changes. So I think there's a big, a big thing to be said about surrendering and going, okay, all right. So run me through professional basketball very competitive sport in England. It's a tough space to, to be. My mum's from Spain, Spain, obviously we're the world champions of basketball, very big sport over there. My little brother played basketball, loved it. Um, seems to be getting bigger in the UK, but still a tough, tough way to, to make a living and to, to really go and do something there. Well, one thing I noticed about coaches that go and do stuff is they often have competitive sports backgrounds. They often have that structure and that discipline. Um, what would you say you've taken from professional basketball that you've held on to today that enables you to to go and, and do the things that you do? I think it is that that discipline side of things. A couple of coaches that I had in a early days, I say early days, or 17, 18, so they, they just believe in like, well, how can you literally be the best in the world? What do we need to do to break this down? And it doesn't it's not about whether you get there or not, it's about the routines and the habits and the work ethic that you put in place and the consistency over time that's then going to lead to success um and it's just yeah some of the early basketball coaches i had literally like okay yes we're going to optimize this part we're going to optimize the things around nutrition around sleep around two and when you look back it was far from optimal <laughs> side of stuff um but it was looking at all areas of your life and saying well can we make each area that little bit better that one percent extra better across the board um so i think so i think it's that mindset that then led me into oh, okay if i'm doing coaching i want to get into be a, a pt in a sense because we weren't transformational coaches or anything there which is a personal trainer <laughs> years gone by if i was doing that the, literally like as soon as i qualified straight away i was like well what am i doing next what's the next qualification i'm doing how can i improve the level of service i'm delivering on there and it's keep trying to upskill and push on more and always trying to learn more and i think that came from the basketball background that you're always trying to practice that same thing that same three point shot or that same free throw, you're doing it a hundred times. Just repeat, 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 repeat. And that's something that so many people aren't willing to do. They're not willing to put in the reps of that consistency, whether it's from a training perspective and being able to master your physique, whether it's from an education perspective, whether it's from a presenting perspective, whatever it is, they're not willing to put in the hard graft and the reps. Whereas I think like that's something that if you are that little bit older, You've almost had to do a bit more because you didn't get that immediate gratification of potentially if you're an online coach before you know it you're 22 23 24 you've got good on social media and you suddenly you've got 50 clients 60 clients 100 clients ah like, oh, where did all this money come from mm -hmm. <laughs> type thing so there's easier potentially to get that immediate gratification i think almost now than it was um 15 20 years ago sort of stuff so i think it's just about the ability to put in the hard graft and not expect an immediate return on your investment um, within so many areas of your life. Know that, okay, in time it will pay off. We don't never know how it's going to pay off, but it, it will come back to pay off somewhere. Yeah. And it's the 10,000 hours concept, <clears throat> the 10,000 hours of you do the reps again and again and again. And one thing I see with coaches is they do education, but they don't actually 
crystallize the education. So they'll go in and they'll do a course and then they're already onto the advanced course, they're already onto the next course and the next course, but they haven't actually digested what it is that they are, that they are learning. They haven't actually reinforced what that is. So for me, I, I qualified as a cognitive hypnotherapist and NLP practitioner. And then the year after that, they, they try and upsell you into the master prac. Now I've got, um, some really, really experienced mentors that said to me, don't do that for two or three years. And I said, why? They said, you should really master your toolkit. You should really know the toolkit that you've got there. You should know all of that off by heart. So that becomes second nature. You, you should, uh, the, the impulsive part of you that wants to just keep doing the next one, the next one, the next one wants to do that, but you should really crystallize this core skill set and really learn and understand and own that to the point where you can do it with your eyes shut. And then when you can do it with your eyes shut, then go up a level. And that for some people that might be 12 months, that might be eight months, it might be two years, it, it depends. Yeah. So I think there's an element of doing the, like you said, putting in the reps, doing the 10,000 hours, because the basics always win. Like the people forget that the basics always win. If you look at Man City as a football club, they do some incredible passes and they, yeah, like they can do things someone else can do, but they do the basics really well. They defend, they do great passing, they make very little mistakes and they own all of that. So I think it is the, the 10,000 hours and not forgetting that you, you do need to do your time. <laughs> There's no one, no one gets out of this. You've got to do your time. You've got to really own that and really crystallize that. Otherwise you can try and do all like, like, you know, the, the 50 yard screamers, but at the end of the day, if you can't catch a pass and then knock it back, you know, it's not going to work. And we can, we can literally bring that into so many different areas of, of life in a sense. When I looked at how my coaching journey runs for clients, in a sense, when they come on board, there'll be certain times when we're maybe pushing, certain times where we're solidifying or even pulling back. And I'm going to slow down the physical result they get to then push on. Hmm. So we've got to understand it's not always about pushing more and more and more or trying to learn more and more and more or implement. It's like, no, actually, let's, let's pull back for a little bit. Let's solidify where I'm at to then be able to push on for, for more because I'm sure from a physique side of stuff, so many people listen to this have got in great shape but they've rebounded from that and that rebound is at different levels <laughs> in different form depending on where people are pushed to but as we get more experience with it it's like well how much can i push without rebounding and that's the same with work with business how much can i push before quote unquote burning out yeah. where my productivity starts to drop so of stuff so like oh do i do an hour's block and then pull back do i do a 90 minute block and then a 10 minute break do i do a 20 minute block whatever it is on there and everything in life in so many areas is about what can I push before I need to pull, solidify, and then maybe go again? Yeah. And, you know, when a client says to me, I'm burning out, the, the mirror I always hold up is, well, are you burning out or are you just fatigued? Because for me, when I burn out, I didn't want to leave. I, I, there's, of course, there's various different levels of, of burnout, but at the extreme end, it led into a, a phase of depression and not wanting to leave my parents' house because I couldn't do this anymore. The, the character or the identity I had built was so tired that he just didn't want to play the game anymore. And that was one level of burnout. Another level of burnout is not being able to function for two or three days. Just everything is blurry, struggling to read. You're so tired, like your physical faculties disappear. Your mental, you're just in, in, in brain fog. Whenever I hold that mirror around the burnout thing, it's like, well, are you burnt out or are you fatigued? Well, actually, no, I'm just really fatigued and tired. Really fatigued. Okay, yeah. all right, so we've, we've pushed you into the red zone. All right, let's pull back into the pull back into the amber, pull back into the green. And now we've got some data. And now we know what your production capacity is at this stage of your life. Let's try and see what we can do. And it's always doing that, that dance with the client to understand, well, is now the right time to push them? Because there are times when you need to give somebody a kick up the arse and go, all right, let's, let's break through these glass ceilings. And there's other moments where it's like, I actually think they are actually genuinely fatigued and entering burnout. Let's, let's do that. But it's always, a, it's always a dance. And for me, that's why I always have mentors in my corner to hold up mirrors to my blind spots, to go, Kieran, I think you're pushing the envelope a little bit too much. Or Kieran, actually, I think you could tighten up in this area. And I think as coaches, I mean, I don't, I, if I ever hire a coach or a mentor, I, I always ask them, have you got a coach or a mentor? And if the answer is no, well, when did you last have one? Oh, I had one five years ago. I'm like, you're not for me because you're, you, as a coach, I do believe you need those people to hold up those mirrors in order for you to stay consistent and also learn and spot those, those blind spots. Yeah, 100%. We need that person to look down on us and check on where we're at and check on, okay, are we pushing hard enough or are we pushing too much? At where, what point are we at? So 
you left basketball, went into PT, went and did that, and then you went to Muscle Mentors. For those that don't know what Muscle Mentors oh, was, there's how, a big, yeah. <laughs> there's a big gap there, uh, like twelve year gap, <laughs> in a sense. Right, um, so I missed a gap. Oh, yeah, we missed the massive stage. Twelve years gap. So yeah. we're we're coaching as, as PT. Wow. Yeah, so I had six, year, six years in LA Fitness as a commercial gym, PT, paying rent, running my own business uh, type thing. And in a sense, the only almost connection and rapport I had with other trainers was traveling and doing courses hmm. because there was a couple of trainers that were in my gym, but they'd do two, three, four months and then disappear. And I was the only successful, say, coach that lasted there, lasted the period, and um, whereas everyone else would leave and go. So I always had to travel to meet people whether it be Mark Coles or people like that. And that's how I still build connections um, through traveling and studying. So stuff. So yeah, six years there. And then fast forward that. Then I had a year where I worked at LA Fitness and also worked at M10. So when Mark Coles opened M10 in Nottingham, I was literally one of the first coaches, I think, that he reached out to. And I was like, oh, James, do you want to come over um, and work with us? We'd already known each other for a fair few years prior to that. I was like, yeah, mate, I'd love to. Uh, but did a bit of transition. And during that transition, I kept close to a full client. It wasn't a full client base, but I still ran 25, 30 hours at LA Fitness and built up to doing 25 hours or so on, with a mark. And there, and, and no joke, was doing 55 to 60 plus hours a week um, side of things. And I just, like, I was in that time where you're late 20s, haven't got kids. You're willing to, you, my wife then, or as soon as my wife then was, let, let me work, happy to work. And I was like, I was happy to, get up 5.30, literally be at work all day. I do five sessions back to back at LA Fitness, drive over to M10 and train, and then do a three, another three, four, five sessions there. Um, and then that started to lead me into the education route. Mark almost pushed me outside my comfort zone side of stuff um, and got me in front of trainers, got me presenting, got me educating in front of trainers. Um, so I started, so did six, seven years or so um, at M10 then left M10 and then six months later started with Callum and under the muscle mentors um, side of things. Amazing. Wow. And when you look at that, you've done the hard yards, you've done the hard yards, you know, um, yeah. you can always tell when someone's done the hard yards, someone has been there and done it and seen it. Cause all That's the like, me, me and Paul from an education perspective is so easy to almost point out and see the coaches who still do some face-to-face -face or have done some face-to-face -face coaching and the coaches who have never done face-to-face -face and purely do online. Once we get to the point where we start to do some practical stuff and interacting with people and they're getting maybe hands-on, it's so easy to see the coaches that have done the hard graft in terms of the face-to-face -face coaching or some of the coaches have gone, no, no, I just, I see the light at the end of the tunnel, I'm going straight into online that's where the pot of gold is <laughs> going straight onto there. Not that you can't do that because they're completely different skill sets. So I stuff. So I'm not saying you can't, um, but it is that, yeah, so easy in terms of how people communicate and connect and stuff like that from a training perspective, I'm not saying all areas of life, but in terms of how people get sort of and coach hands on uh, training side of stuff is massive difference between face to face and online coaches. Yeah. And I've seen that time and time again, you know, throughout our client base, we've had coaches that have been only online. We've had coaches that have been only offline. We've had coaches that are transitioning across. And I think if I was going to summarize, and you, you might say, no, I disagree. But if I was to summarize the key differences between an online coach and an offline coach, offline coach is more about physical presence. It's about how do you control a situation? How do you use the various different cues? I remember one coach said to me when I was doing my squats, don't visualize pushing up the bar, visualize pushing the floor away from you. And I had this psychedelic moment where I was pushing the earth away from me and I never squatted the same again. And it just changed the game, right? So it's more about the physical element of how do you connect with people? How do you communicate? Uh, and it's that confidence and that presence that you can bring to a gym floor environment. Now, if we look at an online coach, for me, I think that's more of a, uh, not to say that the offline coaching isn't a thinking man sport, but an online coaching is a bit more of a thinking man sport because it's more cerebral. There's less actual, you know, okay, how do I get this client a result? I can kind of see them two or three times a week. I can see them coming into the gym and you can see the physical changes. It's a lot more, how do you build uh, a cont coaching container that generates a result in a way that's very different because you're not going to be with them face-to-face -face. so whether that's your communication structure whether that's your onboarding whether that's your systems whether it's the technology 
element. So the way that I see the difference between the two is offline is a little bit more about the, the, the physical game of being in the gym floor, connecting, networking. You still got to market yourself online. That doesn't, that doesn't change on the marketing side of things. And whereas the, you have to have a bit more of a passion for the tech, for a bit more of the systems, for a bit more of the plugging in of all the various different things. And if you don't enjoy the, that, that part, then I think you're going to find things very difficult. And then finally, extroverts are going to find online coaching a bit more of a struggle if they're spending a lot of their time at home by themselves in front of a computer screen. That can be quite isolating and quite lonely yeah. and quite stressful yeah. and overwhelming. Uh, on the flip side, you might have some very introverted coaches that hate being on a gym floor. They love texting and they love messaging and they love doing it in a much more intimate environment. They feel a lot safer and happier with that. So that's where I see the two differences in offline coaching and online coaching. What, what do you see? I agree, I think, with pretty much all of that. I'd say from a personal experience in terms of myself, so I stuff, I'm, I'm almost more introverted definitely than extroverted. You saw that probably when I was teaching with Paul, and that's why me and Paul work so well together because he is that extrovert and I'm going to just sit behind him but then come in at the appropriate time or the appropriate person and I can read the room really well on there. So I'm more introverted, but then also being stuck by myself in a room chatting to loom or whatsapp on my own sends me insane doing too much i'd say thinking and my brain just starts to over sort of procrastinate and i almost end up getting nothing done so i've had to set my business up in a way which pulls that back a little bit i offer more calls more chatting to people so i can still almost keep the live interaction there where so many coaches purely focus, okay, well, how can I scale this and work with X amount of clients and pull back sometimes delivery and everything's either going to be pre-recorded or, or something like that. And they never actually chat to a person. But like, mm. I need that aspect in my day. Certain days are heavier than that. And certain days are more recorded size stuff. So I'm not saying that's there, but it's finding that, that balance that is not purely, okay, if you're online, you're going to be a bit more introverted, happy with dealing with all the, the figures and the texting and the thinking behind the scenes. And if you're face to face, you're going to be a bit more extroverted and be out there. Whereas if, if you are one or the other in terms of a coach, what aspects of your personality really improve the way you deliver your business and what aspects of your passion actually don't, you need to adjust how you deliver it to sit in line with you as a person rather than saying, well, my coach delivered it this way. Mm. I'm going to directly copy my coach because he did it this way. So I'm going to learn from him and copy what he does. Well, if anything, that's the complete opposite because your clients are not you. You co Your coach, in theory, coach you a certain way because of how you are and the type of data and stuff are there. Whereas your clients might be general pop. Your clients might be a 35, 40-year-old female type of thing where your coach's clients is you and you're a bodybuilder or whatever it is. So that stuff where that's a big issue I see with the industry Whereas because coaches coach coaches, then the coaches they're coaching take that information or take their way of checking or delivery and pass it down onto the next person. And we're like, okay, I'm going to copy that system and format. Whereas like, actually, if anything, you should almost do the opposite a lot of the time because it's not appropriate for their, that type of clientele. Tangent there. Yeah. <laughs> We're very clear on our values here at TMP. Our top three values are be water, be honor, be love. Be water. If you think about water, it adapts, it creates, it delivers. So that's the performance yeah. element. Be honor. We're old school. We shake hands and we do a deal. We do a deal and we're transparent and we're upfront and we always do the right thing. And be love. In a world of online coaches, there's another human being at the other end of the technology. There's no need to, to be ruthless or hard nosed, you know? Um, and what you're talking about there is being water, adapting to who you are. And if we think about what stops coaches from adapting, it's the fear of being judged. It's the fear of not doing it right. It's the fear of, of being a true authentic self and putting who you are out in the world. And it's almost easier to put up a mask or a mirror of somebody that you're not and copy somebody else than it is to actually just truly coach how you want to coach. Something that we ask our coaches all the time is, well, how do you want to coach? Some coaches, you know, they're, they're glued to their phones 24 seven. And for some coaches, they love that. They love hyper support. They love being online 24 seven. Other coaches are like, I couldn't think of anything worse. Other yeah. coaches are, I, I need somewhere in between. And some coaches are, I prefer to actually get my clients on calls or I prefer to do Loom videos. And sure, that might not be as scalable, but that's how I want to live in my coaching. So I think it comes down to, to, thinking about well in what way do you want to coach so for me personally i love speaking one-to-one -one, i love speaking on stage i love that 
I really, really, really love that. I also love building independent and interdependent um, clients versus dependent clients. So with my clients, I teach them to raise their hand when they need it. And if they need to learn to let off steam or they need to, to grow, then, then message me anytime. But at the same time, I'm not going to be messaging them every day. How are you getting on? How is everything going on? Because that then creates a dependency. And I don't want dependent clients. That's my coaching philosophy. I want to create independent and interdependent leaders, not dependent coaches where they're, they're having to stay because they don't feel confident enough to go and do the things on their own. For us, building that autonomy is important. So when you can start to recognize, well, how do I want to coach? How do I want to deliver that? And who am I as an individual? Um, and then you build your process and then you build that around who you want to coach and how that works. Because our view is every single human being is unique. We don't believe in cookie cutter um, frameworks. We have the TMP evolution framework, which is foundations, mastery and peak. But I give our coaching team the freedom to get to the checkpoints and how they want to. So they understand here are the benchmarks and here's what needs to be achieved by foundations. They need to have made a big emotional breakthrough. They need to have nailed their structure and their peak performance hours by foundations. By mastery, usually when you shift one thing, there's another thing that comes up. So I want you to make a second emotional breakthrough on that stage. And finally, peak. I want them to have a vision and clarity of where they're going, why they're going there, the psychological reasoning. How you get to those objectives is down to you and the client, because I trust you to adapt on a one-to-one -one level how that works. And that's, that's, how I, that's how we see coaching and that's how we do it. Um, but for other people, it's like, no, We'll, we, we'd run this like a football team. The whole of the football team comes in and they all do the same workouts on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And we will work together. It's a community aspect. That's going to be the thing that gets the result. And guess what? I've got a hundred case studies of the community aspect that's made it work. So it's not necessarily, you know, there's only one way, but when you can be authentic and you have, uh, you coach in a way that you want and you coach people that you want to coach uh, and you have a, a track record of results, then that's, they're the coaches I see being really connected and enjoying what they're doing versus the ones that are kind of clocking in, clocking out. They kind of, they're dropping in out of the industry, they're burning out, they're not enjoying what they're doing. So that, that point that you made there is so spot on about just copying others because they're doing it versus, well, you know, of course there's going to be the fundamental basics, you know, science is science, we can't get around calorie deficit, but the way in which you, you navigate the calorie deficit deficit puzzle and the way that you communicate and the systems and the education that you build, you can do that your way versus um, copying everyone else. So I totally agree with that. And it's the be water element. I think that a lot of coaches are missing out on. I think that almost goes back round in circle to initial points we we're touching on in terms of the ability to educate, solidify almost where your knowledge is at before maybe you move on to that next phase. So, so almost what I mean by that is whether you've learned a system off a coach who's coached you, it's absolutely great if you've done that, but then you straight away, okay, let's run forward with that. Let's move forward with that. Or whether you've learned a system off a business mentor or a business coach, okay, no, let's run straight away, run forward with that. Where I then sitting back and critically thinking and thinking, is this ideal for my clientele? Okay, I've got this way of doing it. Should I actually implement that? Because a lot of the business coaches advise you to run certain ways, but they don't say you've got to in a sense, but because the coaches are so young or naive and having this around, they're like, oh no, well, they said I've got to do this, so they run with it. But actually, no, they're just advising because they're looking at numbers, they're looking at scale, which you can still run it in line with your values. So it's that ability to sit back and think, do I use this process, this system, this format from the coach, from the business mentor, from someone else? Or do I actually sit back and analyze and think, okay, how can I tweak and adjust that? Same thing with like the education. It's like we push forward and no point do we sometimes sit back and think, okay, let me just solidify this knowledge before moving forward again. Yeah. And at the end of the day, the client is at the core, is at the root of everything. So the, the question that we always ask if we have a, a client decision to make is, well, does this decision serve the client? Does it serve the client? And if it doesn't serve the client, then it's probably not the right move for, for us. We know that our clients are busy, they're overwhelmed, they're stressed. So in the course that we've built and we're actually rebuilding the course as we speak, um, most of the lessons in there are five to 10 minutes long max because I don't want to sit there and watch a 60, 60 minute long, you know, 60 minute long masterclass. Are those 60 long minute long masterclasses there for the, for the deeper education piece? Absolutely. They're all on there, but actually to get time to value, to get the result, our clients don't have a lot of time and space. So we've built an app that enables them to go in and go, well, what is overwhelm? 
this is what overwhelm is in less than four, 10 minutes. Great. Here are some tools that you can do in less than five minutes. Here's how you can take a brain dump on a journal. Here's how you can prioritize your work and understand what your priorities are. Actually, here's a seven minute meditation to listen to that's just going to calm you down and get you back in control. So for, for us and our clients, we know that they're busy, they're ambitious, but it's their ambition that often trips them up. It's their ambition and sometimes it creates insecurities and limiting beliefs and comparison and imposter syndrome, all those various different things. So when they're in highly emotional states, they're not going to be able to sit there for 60 minutes and concentrate. But for three to five minutes or five to 10 minutes, it's digestible enough to go do this one thing and this will generate this outcome. And then they go and test it and then it works and they solidify that. So yeah, it's about listening to your clients and understanding. Yeah, that, that resonates so much because uh, myself and Paul, Paul Sandel, my business partner in the PT Project, we literally just announced today, uh, when people listen to this, it'll be a week or so later, but we've announced the na our next intake for our mentorship. And previously, we had two education sessions per week for an hour and a study group. And we're like, that's oh, just too much. Mm. I think we're like, we've pulled it back. So we're doing a similar thing where it's 10 minutes or so per video. So they've got a small chunk, a small key point, learn that, solidify it, and then move on or rewatch and review um, on there. But we're like, yeah, we've, we know in a similar situation, they're driven, they want to learn more, but they're also overwhelmed. They're also probably procrastinating thinking, oh, buddy, I've got this hours video to go through. Mm -hmm. Whereas now it's like, no, let's reevaluate how we run the course and then let's put small chunks together where they've got one, maybe two points within that video and then they move on to the next one. So it is more sort of sustainable in terms of, okay, they're not going to feel overwhelmed. They'll see if I can, well, I've got an hour to sit down and try and take this. And before you know it, an hour's educational video actually takes two hours yeah. when you stop and start and write notes. Um, so stuff. So yeah, we've completely changed how we run our course to sit in a sense in line with that. Right. So you listen to your clients and you observed your clients and you're like, oh, hang on, we're doing it this way. Maybe that doesn't serve the client. So we serve the client in a different way. How can we serve that client in a different way? And for me, the coaches that put the client at, at the forefront of what they do are the ones that usually are the ones that win. The one that loves coaching and they love getting results and they love seeing how people can change. For us, it's all about the mind. It's about challenging people's narrative and their perception above themselves and what their place is in the world and what they can achieve. And we coach a lot about abundance and understanding that there is clients out there to be coached. There's so many. And we coach a lot around perspective and change and, and, and challenging those narratives of, does it have to be this way? Because I think too many people in the coaching world thinks, well, it's only, it can only be this way. It can only be the way that the business mentors told me. It can only be the way that my coaches told me. But when you actually, if we take fitness coaching out of it, if you just look at entrepreneurship itself, entrepreneurship is infinite. There are infinite ways to build companies. You've got Coca-Cola and you've got Pepsi and they're structured completely differently. Yet, what is the end result? It's the same product. It's a bottle of Coke. It's a bottle of Coke. They're exactly the same. But the way in which they've gone to market and they've built their, their systems and operations and their, their way of thinking and their leadership, completely different. So I think it is getting to that place where you as the as the coach recognize that there are infinite ways to, to, to help. There are, inf there are an abundance of clients out there that need your help and you are the unique individual where no one can replace you. And with, with you, James, no one can replace it. You used to be a basketball player. And that's something that people will resonate with other basketball players or people that are fans of basketball. Oh, this guy will understand me. This guy will understand a reference of, you know, how a three pointer works and, and how that plays. They'll understand the dynamics or whatever. I attract a lot of people that um, used to box. I used to box. So uh, when I'm talking about boxing or if I use a lot of football metaphors, because uh, I'm a big Arsenal fan, well, then again, people resonate with that. Some people listen to that and go, ah, not for me. And that's okay. Um, but when you can challenge the narrative of, well, what is my place in the world and what is it that I'm doing? And, and actually, is there only one way to skin the cat or are there infinite ways? Well, then life becomes one of abundance and fun versus one of scarcity and constraint. And that's, that's really the bit that I love to challenge coaches perspectives on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think like just having that sort of idea in terms of, okay, why can we be, be challenged in terms of our thought process and our opinions? Um, it's obviously is key. So a lot of people will be looking up to you, James and going, yeah, but you know, he's been in the industry forever. Like he's got everything sussed. Like he must find this, all of this, this coaching, this business stuff, he must find this all easy. But if we were to look underneath the hood or behind the scenes, what is it that James struggles with today? Um, I think like 
even if you, you're someone like myself who's been around the game for 16, 17 years, and there's not actually that many coaches nowadays have really been in the industry that long, mm. the industry now is night and day different from what it was when I started. So if I wasn't continuing in a position where I was willing to evolve, I wouldn't be here. So yes, having the experience, having the knowledge, stuff like that over the years definitely helps from a results perspective from a client, but it doesn't necessarily help in terms of a business perspective because the industry is now is night and day different to what it was previously on there. So we've always got to continue to evolve and move forward. Um, and if we're not willing to, then we will be, will be less behind. But I'd say a big thing that I know I, even to this day, in a sense, I, I struggle with, um, to a extent is perfectionism. Like for me, I got into sort of pushing forward a basketball because I wanted to be the best. Then I transitioned as soon as I finished playing basketball, I transitioned into bodybuilding mm -hmm. because I wanted to win and be the best on there. And I wanted to have in my eyes, the most aesthetic physique, the best physique physically possible. So I always was chasing someone to be perfectionist. And in a sense, I always felt that I was, you could say maybe a failure because I didn't win. I was mm -hmm. never the best. I lit when in my eyes previously, I never succeeded at anything because I was never the captain on the basketball team. I was never the highest point in score there. I did one win one competition where I stepped on stage, but it took me a number of tries on there. So I never in previous years look back and think, okay, now actually I've come so far. I was always trying to push for more, the standard high performance mindset that you're the sort of similar, obviously the five people that you're around. That's all well and good, but at this moment in time, when the five people are around the multimillionaires, I'm never going to feel adequate. Mm. And that drive for to be perfect is always going to be pulled back. I'm like, oh, I'm not good enough. Yeah. Whereas actually, if I step back and be like, no, actually, I've achieved a fair bit. I've got a fair bit behind me and stuff like that. Whereas I think it all goes back to the thing of one, trying to be ideal, sort of perfect, and trying to push for more. And then two, in certain situations, when I know when I do get wet busy and get overwhelmed, I just sit and procrastinate and don't move forward. Yeah. Perfectionism is a fascinating one because um, you see this with a lot of athletes, that perfectionism to be perfect. And sometimes that can be actually driven by coaches. And what's interesting is uh, you and Paul both are quite perfectionistic and you're both in biomechanics, which is quite a profession perfectionistic game which is about moving in a very certain way and moving and adjusting how somebody's body moves around something and, and, and making sure that that works like that my my i used to really struggle with perfectionism because it came from my boxing coach my boxing coach used to be i kid you not i used to spend hours just doing um I, for those that are listening i'm throwing a right hand down the camera um that for me for years and years to the point where they used to make me draw my footwork so my feet would bleed no, nope, yeah. wrong step. No, nope, I'll have this, have a uh, have cookie. You know, I'm at this point. I'm like, he's, he's my coach. I'm like 15, 16 years old. He sat on the side of the ring. And he's like a 50, 60 year old bloke going wrong, 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 wrong. You're going to get knocked out if you don't sort your feet out, you know, and you, and, and when you cling to perfectionism, I, I do believe it takes you to a certain level, but then there's always a final five or 10% and, that's where you relax and you breathe into that, where you start to go, you know what? I'm not going to throw a perfect right hand. I'm just going to loop it around the side. Let's just see what happens. Oh my God, I hit the target because it's unorthodox. It's, you start to relax and let those things go. But perfectionism is a, it's a fascinating one. And the frame that I always give to coaches is, listen, when a horse wins a horse race, do they need to win it by 25 meters or do they win to, need to win by a nose? They need to win yeah. by a nose. So, of course, it'd be great to win by 25 meters, but the prize money's still the same. <laughs> you're still, you're still gonna, you're still taking home the gold medal. The gold medal doesn't change as to whether you win it by that much or that much. Yeah. So I find perfectionism is always a, a even just even just on that point there. It's like, do we even need to win? Mm. Like, <laughs> whereas that is the belief that so much. Oh, we need to be. The, I need to be the best coach possible. That was fine in a sense. You could maybe say when I was in a small little LA fitness yeah. or even moved up to M10. But now when I'm saying that, I'm looking at certain coaches that are, can handle 150 clients at one time and still deliver a good level of service. Yeah. I 
my mind can't tweak it and thing like that and do that to the same level of service. Or you got guys earning 50, 100, 150K months plus on there. So it's just, it gets bigger and bigger. Whereas it's not even about you've got to win the race at all. Where it's like, no, you sometimes just got to make sure you're taking part and moving forward. And as long as you're moving forward, then, okay, you've got to be cool with that rather than thinking, okay, I need to be the best mm. because you're never going to be the best. Oh, if you are, then you're not playing big enough <laughs> in a sense there. And you're not really on social media and seeing really what's happening nowadays. Um, so it's stuff. So if someone's like, yeah, I need to be the best. And then that's where I thought I wanted to be at before. Whereas now it's like, I always felt I'd failed because I was never the best. But well, I always get philosophical back. with that. And I so for me, it comes back to the concept of winning. Well, what does winning mean to you? Philosophically, winning to me means doing very meaningful work that benefits the world and benefits everyone around me and, and being well paid for that. How well paid? Well, that's down to me. Uh, yeah. It's the concept of not competing. There's two runners in the race. There's the one that's trying to run to win the race and they have to win. They have to beat the other person. They've got to beat everyone else. And then there's the person that's running because they like running and the outcome will be the outcome. But the person that's going to enjoy the journey more is the one that's running because they, they, they enjoy running. So once you identify what your personal definition of winning, okay, so if your definition of winning is being able to work for a particular type of client in a certain way that unlocks a certain lifestyle and living for you, great. So do you need to do that at 50 meters or do you need to do that by a nose? Well, actually you need to do that by a nose, but it always comes down to the individual. What is the individual's, what is the individual's definition of, of success and winning? Because I do believe we can all be winners in our own definitions, not in the binary world. So when I was in boxing, I got onto the England team. I couldn't make team GB. I just wasn't outright good enough. All those kids were faster and sharp and they hit harder. And I just wasn't there. And that's fine. Cause I'd reached at that time, my genetic and psychological potential as to what I could, I could do in that moment before I ended up with an eating disorder and tried to take my own life, you know, but my definition of winning now, if I, if I was to box again, uh, would be, I just want to express myself and just, and just test and tinker and toy. So I think when you start to dive into your own definitions of, well, what does winning mean to me? It means this, okay, do you need to win by 50 meters or do you want to win by a nose in your definition of winning? Well, actually I only need to win by a nose. It kind of takes everybody out because you're running your own, it sounds so lame and cliche, right? You're running your own race, but it is, it is, it's you versus but you. It's doing the things that you it want. Is, it is so, so hard though, as a, entrepreneur or someone that tries to obviously hang around successful people you see what other people are doing it's so hard to step back and think and actually oh, oh i am winning because i am moving forward from where i was one year three year five years ago so stuff mm -hmm. where that's mentally whether that's physically whether that's business wise whatever that is um, but it's so hard to step back and actually see that when you see everyone doing so well on social media and it's easy to get caught up in that yeah, I mean, I think part of it as well is being so, um, it's against, it's about being in a place where you have that freedom to kind of go, well, what am I really measuring here? Because in business, everybody loves to re measure on revenue, but that's just one metric. So I was very fortunate to work with a client out here worth a billion dollars, and I'd never worked with a billion dollar client before. So I could have gone, please, sir please, please give me this shot, give me this opportunity. But the reality was um, I had to take him off the pedestal. So as we was going back and forth when we was talking, I and mean, the thing we bonded over actually was ADHD, which was quite interesting. Um, he's like, yeah, well, look, you know, uh, why, why should I work with you? And I said, well, look, when it comes to the economics, mate, I can't compete and I'll probably never be able to compete, but I don't care about that. So instantly I've taken away that crutch or that stool so you can't look down upon me. When it comes to mental performance and mindset, um, sorry, mate, pound for pound, I win every time. And he's a boxing fan as well. I win by knockout every single day of the week. Uh, and I'm not struggling for clients either. So I've got a space in, in four to six weeks. I haven't even decided if I want to work with you yet. We can explore that and see if it's the right fit or, or not. Uh, the next day, his team did a background check on me. They, they, they searched everything up and he messaged me and he said, yeah, we did a background check. We, I, I want to work with you. And I said, well, I still want to figure out if I want to work with you. Let's meet for another coffee and let's see. Um, and it's understanding that I think humans measure on very binary metrics. How many clients do you have, particularly in the coaching world, how many clients do you have? What's your monthly revenue or whatever? But personally, I would have rather have a coach that's making maybe 10K a month, 
their definition of winning is being able to travel the world and support their family and be financially safe and love clients that they work with. That to me is more a more successful coach than a coach doing, you know, 100k a month. They're stressed. They're unhappy. They're not living authentically. You know, they're 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 a shit family member. They're they're a shit partner. They don't. They're just they're just not in it. So often we get caught up in binary comparison metrics when when we figure out what our values are. And my big value is psychological freedom. When I meet somebody and I can sense, wow, this person, they're at ease. They're at peace. There's no, there's no, I'm trying to get one over on you. There's no fighting. There's no com competition. They're just here. That for me, because I value that very highly, that for me, I, I really go, wow, how could I get there too? And I might even ask, hey man, if you was in my shoes, what would you do? And removing the ego and going, well, how does that work? So I think it's understanding that the, the binary comparison metrics that we that we use to measure as human beings they don't paint the full picture and when you only see the those those parts and often the areas we compare on the areas that we don't feel enough in so if we don't feel big enough we'll see all the guys that are bigger than us if we don't feel like we have enough money we can only spot all the people that have more money than us if we feel I don't know, from a facial perspective, oh, I'm, I don't have a beautiful enough face. And then you see other people with more beautiful faces. It's like, oh, everybody's better looking than me, oh, you know? So I think it's looking inwards and going, well, what actually do I value? What do I actually want to measure on? What is more important? Uh, and then on top of that, it's then going, okay, well, this area that I'm comparing on that's triggering me, maybe they're not the issue, maybe I'm the issue. And what is that? And that's that's how I kind of look at, at comparison. And it's, it's usually... The areas you compare are the areas you don't feel enough in. And if you don't feel enough in that area, you can either go away and do some internal emotional work. Uh, or if you compare it and all you see is inspiration, it's like, what? What? You know, really? Um, then that's when you know you've kind of nailed that that bit. But it's, it's built within humans because if we, if we weren't accepted by the tribe, we were dead. That's the reality of yeah. it. No other animals have 80, it takes 25 years for the brain to formally crystallize. No other animal has got that long level of dependency. And, you know, 17, 18 is when a young man can really start to fight for himself and look after himself and out he goes. But he's still going to get outmaneuvered by the guys that are 25, 28, you know. So uh, that's the comparison drive that often comes in. And that's often where we project. I appreciate that as a bit of a speech, but that's, uh, that's how I see the whole comparison thing. It comes up every day of all of our coaches. Yeah, yeah, it's something we're with no way of getting away, away from it, is there? Like, we're always going to do it. We've just got to be aware of it, in a sense, rather than just, yeah, using that as a driver or using the ego as the driver um, to try and push through. It's like, no, it's that ability to step back and really know where we're at and are we in line with what we say truly value. Yeah. So I've got one final question for you, James. I've deeply enjoyed this conversation. We could probably do this for another hour. I could definitely do this for another hour. <laughs> um, but... What does the phrase total mental performance mean to you? Delete us as a, delete us for a minute as an organization or as a company, but actually the phrase, the words total mental performance, if you had total mental performance, how would you know? I think for, for me, the key thing is probably just that I'm, I'm moving forward in, in life because if I know if I'm moving forward that I might be stressed, but I've still got clarity or control in terms of that direction, maybe that I'm heading. And I know that I am someone that if I haven't got them areas of stress in my life, that I'm not going to get the, the most, whether it's from business or whatever that is, sort of stuff. And I think if I feel like I am moving forward, then and there's clarity on the direction I'm going or I've got control of the decisions in the sense I'm making, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm in a good, I'm in a good place. Uh, whereas I feel at any point, one area of my life, maybe not moving forward, like, okay, maybe I'm not feeling great mentally. And he's coming to that understanding with that as well from a, a physique perspective that I struggled with that for a number of years that, you know, it's like when you've played boxing or done things at a certain level for me playing basketball and then literally it's like, no, I'm done. Stop that and start something different. But it got to a point then with bodybuilding physique side of stuff where like, no, I can't stop that and start something different because now I'm at a point now where my body's starting to break down. Mm. I've got to learn actually trying to manage where I'm at. And that took me a while to realize that, okay, from a physique side of stuff, things always can't move forward. But actually then holding there in a good place is still, in a sense, progression because every other 40-year-old guy is going backwards. 
yeah. <laughs> sense. So I'm still going to look better than a lot of people on that side of stuff. But I think for me, that was a mental thing to get around. That, okay, now if I'm in a good place mentally uh, from a physique side of stuff, knowing that I'm not going to progress and move forward, but then other areas of my life still are able to. Um, so stuff, which I know is a tough thing that a young 20 year old guy won't be able to visualize at all because they always think things are going to move forward from a physique side of stuff, from a performance side of things. Whereas at some point in time, no, it's, it's not, it's going to go the other way. Yeah. It's like the concept of, um, you know, constant progression or cons consistently moving the weights up. Well, one of my clients, Mark Rhodes said to me, well, this is why it's impossible, mate. Cause in theory, if you know, the compound effect of me being able to continuously lift with progressive overload is I should be able to do a 500 kilo bench press at some point, but I'm never gonna be able to do that. That's just not possible. That's just I'm, not where things, it's just not how it works. I've been training now for 26 years, we can say, something like that. I started probably, yeah, in my bedroom doing push ups and stuff like that when I was 14 years old, uh, type thing. And yeah, I'm gonna continue progress and put more weight on the bar or do more reps. It can, ain't gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. stuff. But I had the same problem with boxing. The punches are, are much harder to get out of the way now. Like, like in my head, I'm much faster than I used to be when I when I used to compete. And so I see the punch coming, and then I go boom, and I eat it. And I was like, ah! Oh! And then I move it. It's like it's like I'm fighting in slow mo. Like as the as the body starts to slow down, it's like fuck. Like it's it's surrendering to that and going well. You know, I'm happy with yeah. where I'm at. James, deeply yeah. into this, uh, this conversation, how can everybody find you? Uh, so my Instagram is predominantly the place where everything happens. Um, so it's stuff is James underscore Sutton co underscore coaching, James Sutton coaching with underscores between James and Sutton. Um, but yeah, everything really happens on, on Instagram. I'm someone who will go through phases where work's busy, life's busy, and I'm not as active as maybe as I, I should be from a business perspective, but and generally I try and stay active as possible on there. Amazing. Well, look, guys, give James a follow. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, please share it to your stories and tag us. We're trying to put this message out to the world that you can still be a high performer and you still can find things difficult and you still can be successful. Uh, James, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Cheers, Kieran. A pleasure.